Good morning. Small but mighty crowd this morning. You're the Labor Day weekend folks. Thank you for coming to church this morning. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us at Grace this morning. We're grateful that you are here grateful that you are a part of us. Hey, if you are here, would you sign in for us? We have these friendship pads on each of the aisles. Um, if you would just let us know that you're here, give us some information. There's also some prayer request cards that we take seriously in there, and then there's also some give online cards that you can take with you. I have a few other announcements I would love to make. Today is the last day. Where are all my ladies at? It's the last day to register for our women's retreat that is happening next Saturday, September 9th from 9 to 3 p.m. So if you have not signed up, you want to be there. There's over 50 women coming. It's going to be a great day filled with lots of We have almost 70 women coming. So you do not want to miss out. It's going to be a really amazing day. Please join us. Um, and today's the last day to sign up for that. Today is also our first day of intermission. So it's this new pause with purpose that we are introducing between the services. And today, Kate Schwint will be leading us. I'm looking for her. She's probably with the kiddos. Anyways, she will be leading us through a discussion around prayer. So please be there. As well, Kim Dwyer is not here this week. But next week, she will be passing out books for our book study that we are doing as a church. So if you're interested in doing that book study, um, come to intermission next Sunday the 10th. Next Sunday, September 10th at 5.30 p.m. is also Reverend Rafat's monthly multicultural dinner. If you have not yet experienced one of these, it's really a fun and engaging evening. Come here to Grace at 5.30 p.m. Please RSVP to Elaine or Rafat that you'll be there so we have enough food for everybody. As well, sign up for Dinner for Eights. So Dinner for Eights is just exactly that. You sign up, you want to be a part of something casual, informal, you want to get to know people in the church, want some support around you. Sign up, go to dinner, at whatever night works best or whatever lunchtime works at best, breakfast, I'm a big breakfast person. Whatever it is, dinners, lunch, breakfast for eights, sign up with Elaine for that. And with that, those are all the announcements I have this morning. Let us stand together and sing our opening song, River of Life. Brother, sister, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. Oh, if you've been searching, carrying burdens, if you've been lost and looking for a home, if you've been drifting and something is missing, you should know that you are not alone. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. You are no time to waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. Tealing in the river of life. Come as you are, no time to waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. There's healing in the river of life. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. Sing that again. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. By the blood of Jesus, everything will change. Let that river of life wash it all away. Oh, 
Come on down to the river. Whoa. Come on down to the river. Whoa. Come on down to the river. Whoa. Let that river of life wash it all away. You may be seated. It's Labor Day weekend, and you're here at church. Thank you for being here. Maybe you have a long list of to-dos in your mind. Maybe you have a lot of stuff that you want to be doing this weekend, a lot of stuff that you need to get done this weekend. Well, guess what, friends? You are in a sacred space of pause. So just take a deep breath. Let that to-do list just wash away for a minute. Let all that stuff and the chaos from last week just melt away. Let your focus come to this beautiful sacred heartbeat and the breath that is right before us. You are here right now and nothing else matters but worshiping God, celebrating life, and being in communion with one another. Amen. Any kiddos want to help me with our grace blessing this morning? I know there's one right behind me that might want to help out. You going to come help me as well? Yes, awesome. And who is this, Izzy? This, this is, I forget her name. That's okay. She doesn't need a name, but she's cute. All righty, how does the grace blessing go? Oh, that's so good. Okay, let's ask everybody to stand up with us. Get our thumbs out. And one, two, three, grace in me, grace in you, grace in all of us. Excellent. And you guys can follow Jessica right back there to go to Faith Formation. Let us continue our worship just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come.
you may be seated. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Listen to God's word as it comes to us this morning. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, Before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And here our scripture passage ends. May the Holy Spirit grant us understanding as we seek to apply such a text to our lives. A church the world needs beyond stuff. I am so excited about this scripture passage this weekend. I'm so excited about this series that we've been going through. We've been walking through the gospel narratives of Matthew. We left last week from Justin's theologically rich and profound sermon on Jesus claiming himself that I am the Messiah. And then we come on to this week and we continue on into this next sequence of events. And I truly love the Gospel of Matthew. If you haven't read through the Gospel of Matthew in quite some time, I really encourage you to do some because the way that the scribes write the sequence of events that take place throughout all of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, it's really unique. I'm also a little biased because my favorite professor in seminary wrote a commentary on Matthew. And it's one of the most brilliant pieces of work I've ever read. My husband cracks up because I often read it as entertainment. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so brilliant the way she dissects this amazing text. So I'm excited to share this with you. And I love how we come to this text, this pivotal moment. It says, from this time on, right? So we acknowledge that last week, the message that was preached was really a pivotal time in the gospel narrative. It was this pivotal moment of Jesus claiming himself as the Messiah, introducing himself as the divine one to the disciples. And so now we understand that from that moment, there's a new sequence of events. And this sequence of events that takes place is Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And so Jesus is attempting to explain to the disciples in this text, saying, this is where we're headed. We're headed on a collision course to the powers in place, the economic, political, and religious powers. We're going to wrestle with them. And ultimately, I'm going to endure a lot of suffering. There's a cross waiting for me in Jerusalem. And I love this moment with the disciples, especially with Peter, right? Remember Peter? Just a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave preached that, that Peter's the rock, like Dwayne Johnson, like the rock, the one who, you, who I will build my church upon. And so I imagine that this interaction of Jesus explaining what's going to take place in Jerusalem, I can imagine Peter's like, well, I'm the rock. Like, I need to be heroic in this moment to Jesus. And so he stands up to Jesus. He says, this must not be, Lord. No way are you going to endure a cross or are you going to endure any type of suffering as such. And I love Jesus' response. In fact, I crack up 
Because what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, get behind me, Satan. Like, what? If you've ever seen Ace Ventura, I can't not hear that line without Jim Carrey saying, get behind me, Satan. I love that line. The same exact line that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 4, right? When he's being tempted in the desert. And to this temptation, he says, get behind me, Satan. So here he's talking to Peter. His rock is now his stumbling block. And he says, no, 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 get behind me, Satan. And we can take this phrase, get behind me, in one of two ways. He's either saying, like, get out of the way, Peter. Go away, get away from me, flee from me. Or he's saying, fall in line. Follow me. Get with the program, Peter. And I think that's where he's headed, especially because this next verse that we run into. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross to follow me. What an iconic statement. This is where I want to settle in for today. This is where I want our sermon message to go today of what does it mean to deny ourselves? What does it mean to take up our cross? What a statement. Very scandalous for the time being as well. What is Jesus attempting to say in this moment? Those who will attempt to save their lives are going to be the ones that are going to lose it. There's so much depth to be understood in this text. And I think what Jesus was on to is I think Jesus was saying, there's a lot of distractions. And if you want to follow me, you got to avoid those distractions. You have to deny those distractions. You have to tell those distractions to get out of the way. And I do want to make a side moment or footnote comment here for a moment. My intention with this verse, with this section of the scripture passages, is not to glorify suffering. Western Christianity has often taken these, these moments within Jesus' ministry and used them as a glorification of suffering especially to minority groups, to groups who are already oppressed, to black and brown bodies saying this is a justification to hate, to racism, to discrimination. This is a justification to lynching and to death beyond belief. And I want to put that away. I don't want you to leave this service at all today thinking that I'm attempting to glorify suffering with this passage. Because unfortunately, that's a whole other theological debate in itself. And it has used to harm so many groups. And I feel myself already going on a tangent, so I'm going to veer away from this. But that's not where I'm going. <laughs> the purpose of talking about this text is we've become a culture that loves to be distracted. Oh, I bet I could count how many of these I see in the room right now. Right? How many times we get distracted throughout our daily lives. And so I think Jesus isn't as much glorifying suffering in this passage. I think Jesus is saying a lot of humanity is attempting to avoid suffering at all costs. We're attempting to deny suffering at all costs. That, yes, there will be trials and tribulations in following Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we have to endure this great oppression and suffering. There's a modern philosopher, and he's coined this term, we are a culture of analgesics. Meaning we are a culture that loves to avoid suffering. We love to deny suffering. We love to distract ourselves so much from suffering. I mean, just look at the stuff that we distract ourselves with. So I believe that Jesus is talking about this moment of what's your divine purpose? And what's distracting you? What is the stuff 
distracting you from your divine purpose. And that's where I want to land today. Beyond stuff. How do we become a church that the world needs? How do we become the people of God that our community needs? And go beyond the stuff that we fill our lives with beyond the stuff that we distract ourselves with, beyond the stuff that we use to avoid, deny, or cover up any type of suffering in our human experience. We are a capitalistic, consuming culture. I mean, just drive through the city for a moment and count how many storage units there are. Right? We have these massive buildings for what? Stuff! We literally are like, we don't have enough room in our home for this stuff. So I'm going to buy another storage space for more stuff that doesn't fit in the stuff that I have in my own home. Or it's seasonal stuff that I don't always need. Like, what? My family and I, we just moved recently. And if you move, you realize how much stuff you accumulate. If you are with us on moving day, I think I used another word other than stuff. It's like, what is all this stuff? Why do we still have this stuff? And don't get me wrong, some of it's life enhancing. Some of it's necessarily for a daily basis. And some of it's just so sentimental, you're not ready to let it go, right? But how much of our stuff is distracting us? How much of our stuff is not at all in line with our divine purpose, not at all in line with our ministry, not at all in line with what we are called to be and called to do. How much of our stuff distracts us and brings us actually turmoil in our lives? And also, sometimes that stuff We get it backwards. We start loving stuff and using people rather than using stuff and loving people. Speaking of people, how many people are the distracting stuff in our lives? Don't get me wrong, every person is created in the image of God and beloved And yet, not every single person is meant to have a relationship with one another. Some personalities just aren't meant for one another. In fact, this exact scripture is Jesus wrestling with Peter, distracting him from his divine call. That Peter's the stuff that's distracting. Who are the people in our lives that are distracting us from our divine calling? How many people do we surround ourselves with that are no good for our souls? Don't take that as an excuse not to call your mother or that family relative that you can't stand. (laughs) But how many times do we surround ourselves with the wrong people? How many times do we surround ourselves with energies that don't serve us? Granted, sometimes we have to deal with those difficult conversations. And sometimes, subconsciously, we choose to distract ourselves from what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. What a line. What a humbling line for Peter to swallow and be like, whoa, you just called me your rock and your church. And now I'm your distraction? Because Peter, in all of his finite thinking, was so focused on Jesus avoiding suffering. Right? We don't want to journey to Jerusalem. We don't want to get to a cross. So let's deny it. Let's deny God's call. And Jesus, fully human, fully divine, says, nope. I know I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. Get behind me, Satan. Oh, what a different theological conversation for another sermon and another day. But the term Satan, oh, what a term to use. A term of temptation, a term of distraction. I heard it 
said one time, and I still hold on to this, that evil, evil's favorite type of Christian is a distracted one. Peter was distracting Jesus in this moment. How do we go beyond stuff? How do we go beyond even the people that are distracting us? The stuff that distracts us in our daily lives. So the question we want to leave church with today is look at all the stuff in your life. And take an honest moment with yourself and say, is this distracting me? What is my divine call? Where is my Jerusalem? Where am I headed? Who is distracting me? What is distracting me? Why am I so consumed with distracting myself from my own call? As I prepare to close this sermon, I want to share a story. I love personal stories. It's just, I can't tell a sermon without me giving a personal story, you know. Most of you know I work over at Wincrest. I serve there as a chaplain uh, part-time. And this last week I had several really, really difficult conversations. And I just needed a break. Just needed some downtime. So I went to a place called the Treasure Chest there's this place at Wincrest, and it's, it's managed by residents, and it's, it's, it's a resale store. Usually, uh, residents either donate items, stuff that they have, or it's inherited by people who have passed away. So there's kitchen appliances, there's jewelry, there's, there's clothes, there's dining room sets. There's literally just so much stuff, right? And it's just fun to look at. So I decided on my downtime that I was just going to walk through. They've got amazing prices on everything, too. I started walking through, and I had this profound emotional experience. I truly felt God opening my eyes to stuff, especially as I was preparing this sermon, so anti-stuff. And as I walked through, I saw measuring cups. And I was like, oh, those, those are actually grandma's recipe, her secret sauce that the family gathers around to enjoy a meal together. That this dining room set used to host friends and families and neighbors around sacred holidays, sacred conversations and loving connections. That this jewelry used to make a woman feel so beautiful, so bright. And I walked around, and each one of these objects touched me in such a personal way. I felt myself becoming emotional. These puzzles used to be a couple winding down after a long, busy week, just wanting to put pieces together, one by one. And now it's just stuff. But at some point, this stuff, was used in someone's divine calling. Whether that divine calling was being a loving grandparent, was being a spouse of over 60 years, was being a loving neighbor, a homemaker, somebody constantly inviting people in. So the message today, how can we use our stuff to better serve bless and love other people? How can we use our stuff that we are blessed with to be the church that this world needs? How do we use our stuff as a part of our divine calling? Amen. Speaking of stuff, I'm going to invite my friend, Reverend Anthony, to come up here, prepare communion today. But one day, I don't know, 50, 60, 100, 150, 250 years from now, maybe this table will be for sale at a garage sale. Maybe someone will come to this cup 
and say, oh, that's a nice piece of pottery. Or these candles. It's just stuff. And yet, we celebrate this beautiful sacrament called communion. We have put meaning into what each of these objects represent in our faith and in our lives. We recognize that this table is an open invitation. That there's room for one more and ten more and twenty more at this table. That this table is an open invitation welcoming all people, no matter what walk of life you come from, no matter what you've done in your past, you are welcome here. You are forgiven here, and you are celebrated at this table. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we come to this table. And we recognize the beautiful elements laid before us. We recognize that to some people this might just be stuff. But to those of us who have experienced your love, your divine call, your divine grace, mercy, and justice, and forgiveness upon our lives, that this represents something so much more. That this represents an invitation to be a part of your family. This represents an invitation to be your vessel of light in this world. That this represents a moment of pause in the chaos of our busy lives to simply acknowledge the life of Jesus Christ, the life that at times we still think is such a mystery, but that we get to come to humbled and challenged and reminded of your love. We come to this table with grateful hearts, overflowing with all that you have blessed us with. We ask that you would continually guide us, lead us, and challenge us in how we can continue to be blessings into all of the world, that we can be the people of God and the church of God that this world needs. We bind this prayer and all the unspoken prayers of our hearts together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of Jesus' arrest, he lifted up a piece of bread. Typical element of the meal. He blessed it. He gave thanks, and he broke it. And then he said, take, eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me every time you eat this bread. Ooh. He didn't talk about that. <laughs> every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord to us and to all until he comes again. Ushers come forward to serve this morning. We'll come one row at a time.
will see you stop believing oh my soul you are not alone there's a place where fear has to face the god you know covenant for each and every one of us. Of all the stuff we collect, of all the stuff we hold on to in our lives, those finances can have our tightest grips at times. And we come to a passage as such, that those who attempt to save their lives will lose it, but those who are willing to give it up for the sake of Christ and the mission of God in the world will gain it. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. There are multiple ways you can give. You can give online, text to give, mail, or we pass plates among one another this morning. Give this morning and give with generous hearts. Please stand when you are ready. With us, our bow down version. God sent his son. They call him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon. And
Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Because Christ lives, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds a future. Passage in Joshua says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when you go out to your homes, to all of your stuff this afternoon, I want you to think, As for me and my stuff, we will serve the Lord. And may God bless you and keep you, shape you and mold you, love you and hold you today and all of your days. Thank you for coming to church. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.